I'd like to call this meeting to order the um, Public Safety and Veterans Subcommittee. Um, is there any call to the public? All right, we have no cards, so is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, motion carries. Consent to actions um, two through four. I move approval. All right. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries, and we're at number five. My pigeon problem. All right, we're talking about pigeons today. This is one of our mayor's favorite subjects for the week. Good morning, uh, Chairman Nowakowski and members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Spencer Self. I'm the director of our Neighborhood Services Department, and I'm joined today by Bob Lozier, our deputy director over our preservation division, which enforces our codes. Uh, and today, yes, we are here to discuss pigeons. Um, more specifically, the, re the city recently received a complaint from a resident uh, regarding an excessive number of pigeons at her home believed to be caused by a neighbor's feeding of wild pigeons. Uh, pigeons can be a nuisance in that uh, in large numbers they can carry diseases that are transferable to humans. Uh, their waste is acidic and it can damage the paint on vehicles and other property, uh, not to mention the odor and just general visual blight that they represent. While we do have an ordinance that deals with pigeons, which Bob will talk about in a moment, uh, we do not currently have a city code that deals with the feeding of wild pigeons. This past summer, the city of Tempe did enact an ordinance that does allow for the enforcement of feeding of wild birds. Um, and the complainant asked us to consider that ordinance and look at adopting a similar ordinance here in Phoenix. The city of Tempe's ordinance really does three things. Number one, it identifies the feeding of wild birds as a nuisance. It allows for the enforcement if the city received signed complaints from three separate households. And it also allows for a waiver uh, of the uh, signed complaints if there's a clear nuisance uh, established. So that, that allows the discretion for staff to be able to enforce even without those three complaints. The great thing about this ordinance is that it, uh, it does allow us to deal with an issue such as the one that the resident is currently facing. Uh, it also, through the requirement of the three complaints, uh, it, it would reduce the possibility of neighbors using this as a harassment tool against one another. Um, and it really does, uh, it, we think because of that mechanism, it wouldn't be overly burdensome on staff in order to implement this. We wouldn't need additional resources. Um, some of the drawbacks that I just want to note real quick is um, it, it may be difficult to establish whether or not someone is actually feeding pigeons. If we're not seeing them in the act, how can we establish and verify that that is something that's occurring? Um, something else is that uh, the city of Tempe's ordinance identifies the nuisance even on public properties and the neighborhood services department currently we enforce on private property so that's something that um, we may not be able to address outside of private property um, I'll also note that since enacting the ordinance the city of Tempe has received a handful of complaints however it hasn't had to go to enforcement on any of those they've been able to effectively educate residents and have them stop feeding the wild birds um, just through that. So now I'll hand it over to Bob, who will talk a little bit about our current pigeon ordinance. Good morning, Chairman Nowakowski and members of the subcommittee. Um, the, the animal ordinance in, in, the, in the city code is Chapter 8, and the portion of Chapter 8 that the Neighborhood Services Department um, does enforcement on really focuses on keeping and maintaining animals on private property. Um, specifically in regard to pigeons, there's a section 8701, as you see, um, that addresses the keeping and maintaining of pigeons within an enclosure, and that was an issue that came up uh, many years ago, you may be familiar with that. So it, it, in regards to the regulations really describe what it takes to keep that in a healthy manner. So cleaning the waste out on a regular basis and feeding and watering within the enclosure and not outside of the enclosure. Um, what the, the code currently doesn't have, as, me as Spencer mentioned before, is any language about feeding pigeons at large or wild pigeons. So um, as currently written, they, the uh, violations of these charges um, can be charged either uh, civilly or criminally. 
So what we have for you today is, is really two options that we'd like you to consider. Um, option A would be to go down the path of drafting uh, an ordinance amendment much uh, in line with the Tempe ordinance and go through the, the public uh, meeting process to, to get additional public input. Um, the other option would be to leave the, co the code as uh, currently written. So for today, staff is really looking for direction and input from, from the subcommittee to determine what path you would like to see the Neighborhood Services Department go down. And with that, we'd be happy to add, answer any questions you may yes, have. Yes, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I don't want to stop people from feeding wild birds. I mean, but that's obnoxious, and I certainly wouldn't want that on a daily basis. That photograph. Right. Um, I've talked to this woman a couple times. Her yard is a mess. Her house has droppings all over it. And this is an everyday occurrence. And I, I have great sympathy for her. I just don't think that ought to be allowed because I think it is a health concern besides being a nuisance. So I would like to see staff go ahead and draft some language uh, like Tim P has. I think making three neighbors, the witnesses, they all can confirm um, somebody is feeding them and encourage them to be in the neighborhood. Again, once you have them, it's very difficult to get rid of pigeons. So I would like to see uh, us have this go forward and have staff draft some language uh, to follow those guidelines. Any other suggestions or comments? I like to. I'll oh, go ahead, Councilmember Mendoza. Thank you. We will have an education component, right, to of, this. Of course, yes. We we always lead with uh, with education and and with hopes that uh, our residents will change their behavior and come into compliance without having to go to that that enforcement route. Okay. Thank you. And I just really want to thank the mayor because she really protects our from the puppy mills to making sure that. You know, we're not against rodeos, but we're against abusing animals, so making sure that animals are treated fairly. And then, you know, just thank you for all that leadership that you've had in protecting, you know, sometimes our best friends in, in the world, right? Thank you. So thank you, Mary. And, and th that direction that she gave you, if you could please follow that and um, bring it to the full council, right? Right. Do I need to make a motion so that it goes, or is that direction enough? Okay. All righty. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we're on item number six. We're, we're going to be talking about our texting ordinance. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Nowakowski and members of the subcommittee. Mike Kernbach here from police. With me here today is Yesenia Dote from the Office of Government Relations. We'll be providing you with some information on the city's current texting ordinance as well as an update on several legislative proposals at the state level that seek to remedy the issue of distracted driving. So first, with regard to the current city code. Phoenix City Code 36-76.01 was enacted in late 2007 and it specifically prohibits the use of personal digital assistance to send or receive written messages. To be clear, the code addresses written messages only, and it doesn't preclude the use of a hands-free device or Bluetooth to send or receive said message. There are certain exceptions in the code for first responders, uh, for operators of commercial vehicles through the course of their duties, etc. Now the current city code is deemed a non-moving traffic violation. So with it, it carries a fine of no less than $100 for an offense, or if the offense leads to a collision, a fine or fee of no less than $250. The law has been in effect, the ordinance, for a little over 11 years, and during that time we've issued a total of 189 citations for violations of this Phoenix city code. Of those 189 citations that were issued, 131 drivers were found responsible, 13 were found not responsible, and 41 were dismissed. So to provide context, because I think context is important, 
we've averaged a little over 17 citations a year uh, for violations of this ordinance since it was put into effect. Now to talk about uh, legislation that exists in other municipalities around the state and some proposed legislation, I'm going to turn it over to Yesenia. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, so currently there are 20 municipalities in the state of Arizona that have some sort of um, law to regulate texting while driving. That includes three counties and 17 cities. Um, and at the state level, there are currently six proposals to address the issue of texting while driving and or distracted driving. And, and like the local laws, they all vary in the approach. So either by having a, a cell phone ban or addressing distracted driving, and they vary in the fines. And I'll go through each one of them. Um, and please stop me at any time if you have any questions on the individual proposals. So House Bill 2069 was introduced by Representative John Kavanaugh, and it is scheduled to be heard in committee this afternoon. And what the bill does, it makes it a non-moving civil traffic <coughs> violation to use your cell phone while um, to use your cell phone to send a written message similar to what we have in our city code um, while operating a vehicle on a highway. It does make any violation subject to a civil penalty of $100 for the first violation and $300 for a second or any additional violations. House Bill 2165 was introduced by Representative Townsend in, in the what this bill does, it addresses distracted driving. And so it, it, it makes a person driving a vehicle while being distracted um, guilty of a guilt of reckless driving, which is a class two misdemeanor. Um, the bill doesn't define what's constituted as distracted driving. It has not been scheduled to be heard in committee. House Bill 2531 um, takes a hands-free approach, um, so requiring drivers to use Bluetooth um, while using their cell phone. And, and, and with this bill, it would make it a misdemeanor as well um, if you get caught using your cell phone while driving, but you have, to be, you have to do it in the presence or purview of an officer in order to be cited for it. Um, my understanding is that Representative Chavez is collaborating and working with Senator Kate Brophy McGee, who has a different proposal in the Senate to try to address this issue in a bipartisan manner and have both bills be similar to each other. Um, we have not seen that amendment language, my, but my understanding is that that will be proposed next week in committee. House Bill uh, 2600 was introduced by Representative Carroll. And similar to um, the proposal by uh, Representative Townsend, this addresses the issue of distracted driving. It doesn't provide a definition to what distracted driving is. Um, and now the other two bills are Senate bills. Senate Bill 1141, again, addresses distracted driving. Um, it's broad in that it doesn't define what distracted driving is. My understanding is that Senator Messner is working to address um, and make some amendments to his bill to provide more clarity so that for an enforcement purposes, officers can know what is considered distracted driving versus not. Um, and then as I mentioned, uh, Senator Brophy McGee is working on a provision uh, texting while driving. And she uh, has held a few stakeholder meetings and the city of Phoenix has participated in the approach that they're taking is that they're wanting to ban the use of cell phone while driving from, from the phone being in your hand. And so what they would require is for a, a person while operating their vehicle is to have Bluetooth. Um, it does provide some exemptions for certain occupations and um, when you answer your phone, a click or a swipe, they provide exemptions for that. Um, and my understanding is that they're wanting to provide a delayed effective date on this bill if it were to be passed so that the public could be educated of the change in law. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mayor? Do you have a recommendation on what we should adopt or follow or, or just whatever comes through? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Mayor, my recommendation would be as 
the bills are moving through the process and as I mentioned they're changing with amendments is for staff to be supportive of the approach of having a statewide ban on texting while driving but ensuring that there are certain pieces that we currently have in our city code that are included for example making it a primary offense ensuring that there is clarity for um, law enforcement to be able to enforce the law and just being actively engaged um, in those conversations and working with the different departments and with the mayor and council offices in our briefings providing you regular updates. Because it sounds like 1165 encompasses everything that you need uh, and has more cooperation amongst uh, both houses. So um, I would hope you would continue to be engaged. Yes. Any, if not, can do we need to have a motion to send this to council to include in our legislative package to continue to follow and to uh, support? I think the item about posted for action today would keep your motion, but they can't. No, I'm just making a recommendation. A, making a recommendation that it go to council for full consideration. You know, I would agree with that recommendation. I think it's really important that if you're driving in Phoenix, Tempe, or even in Flagstaff, that we all have the same texting law. So having the state create a texting law for the whole state is, and it blankets the whole state is, um, it's easier to educate the community. If uh, we already have 20 different ordinances, and if we as the city of Phoenix would um, enhance ours in any different way, um, it's confusing. So I think that um, I would agree with the mayor that we should um, support and, and have our government um, individuals that are out there lobbying for ourselves that um, we, we push this effort as a statewide effort and that um, we don't have 20 different uh, municipalities uh, with 20 different ordinances and confuses people, right? Uh, Mr. I ask you, Vice Mayor. Uh, so I might just point out, if you wanna be for what's going to happen, when I look at the list of sponsors, I see this Senate president and the speaker on there. I mean, I, I could read the tea leaves and maybe think this bill has a likely chance of success. So um, if our officers are you know, kind of preparing for what's in the future, you know, what this is gonna look like, how to implement this bill might be a good place to start. I agree. And this bill would also help the police officers to identify if somebody has a cell phone to their ear that you can actually um, pull a person over for that, right? Yes, Mr. Chairman, that, that's the challenge with the current ordinance as written. It's very hard to determine if somebody is using their phone for some other, other, other application, if they're making a phone call, if they are actually texting or receiving. So something that is a little bit more clear would be very helpful for law enforcement. So the hands-free would be the pro and then you were saying just for clarification that if somebody received a phone call you can answer it but you just can't have it next to your ear and be driving not using both hands right yes mr. chairman as introduced the bill does provide some language um, it, for people to have the ability to answer their phone but as I mentioned my understanding is that there's going to be a proposed strike everything amendment to make some modifications to the bill but still having that approach for hands-free but allowing individuals to be able to you know tap and click to answer those phone calls so going with the wisdom of our vice mayor I think we should, uh, <laughs> yeah. we should support this bill and, Can I have, I have and push it and window Thank you. Does uh, SB 1165 address any uh, uh, class two misdemeanor violations? Mr. Chairman, Councilwoman Mendoza, as introduced, the, the bill makes it a civil penalty. So for the first offense, a violation would be anywhere between $75 and $149. A second or additional violations would be anywhere between $150 and $250. Uh -huh. um, so that is what is being proposed in the amendment. And I should clarify, as the bill was introduced, it made it a petty offense, um, which would have made it a... Um, 
a, a, not a primary but a secondary offense and so what they're wanting to do is change it to primary but it, to my understanding it's not addressing it as a misdemeanor okay so if a driver um, causes a death of someone while texting and driving that's not addressed in 1165 Mr. Chairman, Councilwoman Mendoza, as introduced, that was not addressed in the bill. Okay. Um, in your first, on 1165 of the first sentence, where it says, unless the vehicle is parked or stopped. So I've, if I stop at a red light, am I able to text? Mr. Chairman, Councilwoman Mendoza, so my understanding is that yes, where it says stop pursuant to the section and current statute is that when you're in a red light, you'd be able to check or read a message, but while you're physically driving and operating the vehicle, your phone would not be permitted in your hand. Thank you. Uh, um, Vice Mayor? Oh, unless the mayor. Oh, mayor? No. So, uh, so I wasn't even recommending just being a practical man, you know, it's, what might happen, you know, uh, in terms of the officers getting prepared, and to that end, so I guess it piggybacks a little bit on something Felicita was saying. So I don't want to mention the celebrity's name, but a few years ago on the Pacific Coast Highway, so it was not in Arizona, a celebrity, and I think this has now been adjudicated, but again, I don't want to use their name, they were allegedly texting, as my understanding on Pacific Coast Highway, for those who are familiar, it's kind of a dicey place to be doing that ran into somebody and killed them. And it was quite the production, the suspicion was that they were texting, that's why they just ran into this, this other person's vehicle. Um, but it was quite the production to get uh, the t proof that they were texting, which I think eventually did happen. Um, so I guess my question is for like a, an offense like this, how do you, you think somebody was texting while they were driving but even in a case with a fatal, granted in another state, I mean, how many hoops are gonna be jumped through to prove that? How do you get a hold of their phone to like see that? So Mr. Chairman, Vice Mayor Waring, in the example that you just cited, this, this law is, is this law, but we would conduct a criminal investigation, mm -hmm. vehicular homicide, it could be all the way up to first degree murder which then, through the development of probable cause, would allow us to get into the phone to determine whether or not the phone was being used at the time, if there were text messages being sent or received. So this wouldn't preempt us from doing that, which would be a, a greater offense, a criminal investigation. Is really no, I mean, I understand. I guess my point was, you know, most, most instances where you use this, the, the 17 a year you're referencing, I, I'm sure wouldn't be, obviously, fatal accidents. So for something that's less than that, no accident at all, it's just a primary stop. The person could either delete the texts or something. How do you ever establish that they were texting while the car was not stopped? So, Mr. Chairman, Vice Mayor Waring, that's why the hands-free provision is so important to us, because otherwise they're automatic built-in defenses. So the idea would be you saw the phone in their hand? Yes, sir. I guess, so I'm just trying to think of the practical, again, to my question or, or my point earlier, you know, be prepared to implement this, but you want to implement something that's workable. I just don't know, I mean, I guess I assume, you know, if I text just sitting here, I'm going to look at the phone to see what I'm texting. People aren't going to be like holding it up and waving it and trying to press buttons so that officers can see it. It's going to be somewhere down and they're going to be looking down, presumably. Um, you know, I just don't know how many people are going to actually be like observed doing this just because I think almost by definition the person's going to have the phone below the dashboard or it's going to be hard to see. You know, it's not going to be up like being held. So the, the texting part of it, it's, I'm not saying I'm not supportive, it's just I was just curious like how is that going to be, how often is that really going to be a primary offense on the texting portion, not the calling portion, but the texting portion. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean. Mr. Chairman, um, 
Vice Mayor Waring. So this doesn't directly answer your question, but it does provide some clarification and background on the bill. So it's my understanding that the approach that they're taking is similar to an approach that was taken in the state of Georgia last year. And what the proponents have been saying is that the state of Georgia saw a significant reduction in their accidents based on this new law that was enacted. And, and, and the bill, um, as it relates to a, an individual's privacy rights, mm. it does provide a provision saying that an officer cannot take somebody's phone right. and go through it to prove like right. you were sending a message at this particular time. So I hope that provides a bit more clarity, but it doesn't directly answer that example. I just wouldn't want a lot. Of, so a couple things. I appreciate that, that clarification. So we had the same experience. I did the, the DUI bills. Best thing that ever happened was that publicity. <laughs> you know, articles in the paper, we're going to have these tough bills. I mean, so before they ever even went into effect, fatalities started to, to drop and really have stayed there since because there was just more awareness. And, and the lawyers did a lot of the work for us by doing advertising, saying, oh, there are these terrible bills. You know, if you get caught, call us. And so some people you can kind of scare straight. So I understand the thinking there, even if you never actually implement it, just the fact that people are going to know it's out there and a possibility potentially. That definitely helps, and I appreciate that because that, that makes sense. Um, in terms of, I forgot, there was a second part that you said that I was going to respond to. Um, I jumped on the easier part first. Um, Parking and texting, maybe? Uh, oh, yes, because that could get really dicey. So you would, to your, because you said something specific that I wanted to respond to, was the, so you're stopped at a light, apparently it's okay to text. You know, it's going to be, I mean, is, I don't want to chew up a lot of the officer's times needlessly trying to either go to court to get phones for a, was $79 or something fine. I'm not saying it's not dangerous or important. It's just at some point we have a limited number of officers and that's just going to become unworkable. The case I mentioned is a fatality. Obviously, that's a completely different scenario. And even then, it was hard. Even then, I think it took quite a while to get that phone. But then you also have to match up the time of the text and the fact that the car was actually moving. Um, you know, that's going to be tricky. Is the officer going to have a stopwatch and then, you know, be like matching it up somehow? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if the GPS is in the cars now. Maybe that's possible. But again, we just don't want to send officers down a rabbit hole where they're trying to track down a few of these cases. I think your explanation was a good one. The public publicity alone will hopefully make people realize how dangerous this is. There might be some news stories about, you know, this is this is not good. We shouldn't be doing this. And that people will kind of get scared straight, I guess, um, as opposed to actual practical implementation, which could be pretty hard. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, Council Member Mendoza. Thank you. How soon do you think we can see a bill on the governor's desk? How soon do you think we can see a bill on the governor's desk? And is there uh, support by the governor? Um, Mr. Chairman and Councilwoman Mendoza, while I can't predict how soon something can move through the legislative session, um, I can say that next week is the last week for bills to be heard in their uh, chamber of origin, and then the bill would go to the other chamber and go through the entire process again. So if, if I had to guess, maybe April, end of March, um, and in a radio interview, the governor said that if a bill were to make it to his desk, he would sign it. And um, this came in light of the recent passing of the officer of, a, a, few, a month ago or so. And the governor was interviewed, and he said that he would sign a statewide approach if the legislature were to pass it. So he put the challenge on them to get that done. And seeing that we have a person that was actually a representative that understands the system, do you think that can go that quick? You know, I hardly know anybody down there anymore. I do know <laughs> some staffers. Um, so in terms of the bills switching, you know, that doesn't necessarily – I've seen bills pass 30 nothing in the Senate and die in the House, so you just don't know. I would think something like this, just looking at the list of names, I see Democrats and Republicans, um, you know, Obviously, there's definitely a signal being sent with the Senate President and the Speaker of the House on there. They control the agenda. They decide where the bills are going committee-wise. They could jam it up or they could move it through. I think it's unlikely they would jam up a bill with their own names on it. That would be somewhat atypical. I'm not sure what would be the point of that. So it could move pretty fast, but 
but I always caution anybody, don't get your hopes up about it, like sliding through no matter how popular you think something is. And then it depends on whether they could put an emergency clause or something on. Because if they don't, now you've got another, you know, wait until after the thing actually gets signed, which, you know, it sounds like the governor's already said he's gonna, so it's just a question of getting up to him. But that could still take several more weeks, for sure. Thank you, um, Vice Mayor, for your free advice. <laughs> you asked for it. I wasn't going <laughs> to offer it. I love to uh, spout uh, off, but I wasn't going to this time. But Councilmember Mendoza. Thank you. Uh, if this was to pass and it becomes a law, will the city do uh, education uh, program or component of this so we can let our constituents know and just the public know about the law and before it comes into effect? Is that something that we will um, do? Mr. Chairman, Councilwoman Mendoza. So my understanding is that the the legis the proposal does direct for a, a wait period, so a delayed effective date. Um, and so what that would require is for the Department of Transportation to put up signs at the entrance of highways stipulating um, texting while driving is against the law. But to answer your question about educating City of Phoenix residents, uh, I would imagine that we would work, collaborate to get the message out and get that known. We need signs on our streets. I would think we put it in the service, the water bill. Everybody reads that, and that's an easy way. And on our city web page, uh, put out the notice as well as individual newsletters that we do. Well, with that, any other questions? There's no cards. Just really want to thank you all. And um, the recommendation is really to go out there and advocate for one statewide ordinance that will um, deal with the texting and driving and, and making sure that hands free that it's clear with the police officers that um, somebody is using their phone. And move it to the full council uh, for inclusion in our legislative package would be great at the next meeting. You heard it from the mayor. It's done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. With that, um, we have no more items. So we're looking at no call to the public. So future agenda items. Milton, um, yes. do we have any? Or? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, next time there will be a uh, document in your packet for information only regarding civilian review. Um, there will also be a towing update. And then there will be uh, two information uh, only items, one dealing with the city's relationship with Franklin School, and also um, a document uh, detailing the results of us hiring police assistance. And so all of that will be part of the agenda. Thank you, sir. Is there any other future agenda items? If there isn't at the moment, you can always um, present them to our office and we'll make sure to get them to the, as an item on the next agenda. With that, thank you all and the meeting's adjourned.